But bottom line, we need to have a country where America comes first, where the American people know that our borders are secured, that our laws will be upheld, and that the American people will come first. And we, I yield back, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We yield back. Jump yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3rd, 2013, the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamendi, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the opportunity to uh, discuss this evening jobs, putting Americans back to work, building our foundation for economic growth. For many, many days now, in fact, for more than two years, the uh, Democrats in the House have been discussing a project which we call Make It in America. These are strategies that we're putting forth to develop more jobs in America, to rebuild our manufacturing industry, and to bring wealth back to the United States. Uh, I would love to comment on the issues that I've heard earlier, or just my colleagues on immigration, but I'll let that go. I would just say one thing. The uh, last comment that was made about the earned income tax credit, I would remind our colleagues that that was a Ronald Reagan program. Take that for what you might. Um, well, back to make it in America. We, these are the basic issues. We talk about trade policy, fair trade policy, not giving away our opportunities, tax policy to encourage uh, manufacturing and jobs here in the United States, energy policy, how we're going to uh, renew our energy system, become uh, energy independent, the role of uh, clean fuels, the role of renewable fuels and gas, the labor market, education, Perhaps the most important of all of these is a well-educated workforce. If we have that, many of these other issues will fall into place. The role of research in creating tomorrow's economy, tomorrow's uh, businesses, uh, the things that need to be made in the future. But tonight we want to talk about not the least on this, it just happens to be the lowest on this list, and that is infrastructure. It's one of those critical investments. It's the foundation upon which the economy grows or not. If we have a solid infrastructure, transportation systems, water systems, sanitation systems, communication systems, uh, research facilities, educational facilities, that's all part of the infrastructure. Some of it is private, much of it is public investment. But this is one of the fundamental investments along with these other issues here that our economy has traditionally made over the years and Unfortunately, in the current situation, we seem to be falling off the power curve that created the foundation for the American economy upon which to grow. So today we're going to really focus on this infrastructure issue. Not a new issue. Actually, George Washington, I think he was our first president, told his cabinet secretary, a treasury secretary, to develop an inf a uh, plan to grow the economy, called a plan for manufacturers. And Alexander Hamilton came back to Washington with a plan. One of the many points that he raised and suggestions that Alexander Hamilton made was to create infrastructure. He said the federal government ought to build canals, ports, and roads, fundamental infrastructure upon which the American economy would grow. And those things were done right back at the very beginning of this country. So from the very earliest days, the federal government has been involved in building infrastructure. Now tonight, joining me are two of my colleagues, Mr. Delaney from the great state of Maryland and Mr. Castro from Texas. They're going to talk about infrastructure. And I'd like now to turn to Mr. Delaney, who has a proposal that actually the President of the United States suggested in his the American Jobs Act, a program that he 
put forth more than a year ago that the Republican Congress has done nothing with. So Mr. Delaney has picked up one of the suggestions that the President made, made it whole, and has presented legislation on an infrastructure bank. Mr. Delaney, please join us and tell us about how the infrastructure bank would work and what it would do for I will, America. I'll do that. And thank you, Mr. Speaker, uh, for allowing us this time this evening. And I want to thank my good friend and colleague for California for organizing our discussion here this evening and his work on Make It in America. It's important work, and it's work we as a Congress should be focused on. And I think my colleague from California knows that I'm very pass passionate about the infrastructure investments that we need to be making as a country. I quite frankly believe it's our number one domestic economic policy challenge and opportunity. And I say that for three reasons. First, it is the easiest way to get Americans back to work with jobs that have a good standard of living, which should be one of our main focuses as a Congress. Secondly, making a smart and significant investment in our infrastructure, in our road and transportation infrastructure, in our logistics, in our communications, and in our energy and water infrastructure. Making a smart and significant investment in this infrastructure will improve the overall competitiveness of the United States, which is the number one thing we should be focused on when we think about our future in the context of a global and technology-enabled world. And the third reason I favor infrastructure investments is because they pencil out. In other words, the data overwhelmingly suggests that an investment in infrastructure has a very, very good payback uh, to the economy. Just to put the infrastructure situation in this country in context, I want to cite a recent report done by the American Society of Civil Engineers. And they do a survey of our infrastructure every two years. Their report recently came out and they provided us a grade. They actually grade each component of our infrastructure. Our cumulative grade is a country. And remember, this is the wealthiest, most successful country in the history of the world. Our cumulative grade for our infrastructure was a D plus. And the civil engineers estimate that we have to make an investment of at least two to three trillion dollars to bring our infrastructure up to a grade that we deem successful. Two to three trillion dollars. In addition, there's an argument that the existing investments we make in infrastructure, even if they were to be increased, the programs that we have, the very, very important infrastructure programs we have as a country, like investing in the, or, or making sure the Highway Trust Fund is, uh, is funded at the level that's appropriate and, and consistent with historical averages, even if we were to make these investments, which I clearly believe we should, and I know my colleague from California believes we should, there's still a very strong argument, or the data would suggest, that we will continue to accumulate an infrastructure gap. In other words, the amount that we need to invest in our infrastructure to make us competitive will continue to grow. And so this is a very, very significant problem. And to put this problem in further context, we need to remember that infrastructure is a, is, is, are services and investments for the common good. They're public services and they're historically made by governments, the federal government, the state governments, and local governments. And we all know that governments are under fiscal pressure right now. Both our federal government and our local governments are under pressure. So we need, as we think about investing in our infrastructure, to not just be funding the existing programs that we have up to the levels that they deserve to be funded at, and that should be a main priority of this Congress. But we also need to be thinking about new and creative and fiscally sensitive and sustainable ways of investing in our infrastructure across the long term. Our infrastructure problem is a multi-dimensional problem, meaning there's lots of reasons we have this problem. So we need numerous tools to solve the problem. And one of those tools I think exists in legislation that's been filed that we led, it was filed several weeks ago in the Congress, that right now has 18 Republican and 18 Democratic co-sponsors. So it's truly bipartisan legislation. We also have 25 uh, groups that have supported the legislation, outside groups representing uh, uh, both parties typically in terms of their orientation. The Partnership to Build America Act creates the American Infrastructure Fund, which is designed to be a large-scale infrastructure financing capability that can finance many of the projects my colleague from California will talk about tonight, Mr. Speaker. But what's important about the American Infrastructure Fund is it's funded without any appropriations from the government. Instead, it's funded by providing corporations with an incentive to invest. Under the uh, Partnership to Build America Act, the America Infrastructure Fund is capitalized with $50 billion of capital. The capital comes 
from the fund selling bonds that are not guaranteed by the federal government. They're long term, 50 year, and they pay a 1% interest rate. So they're very attractive, low cost capital that, if put into the American Infrastructure Fund, will allow it to provide $750 billion of loan guarantees to local governments and direct loans, if necessary, to local governments. $750 billion of funding capacity. Over a 50 year life, we expect that money to turn two to three times, and so that could be up to $2 trillion of financing without any appropriations from the federal government. The $50 billion that capitalizes the American Infrastructure Fund comes from selling these bonds, bonds not guaranteed by the federal government, 50-year bonds, 1% interest. As an incentive to get companies to buy these bonds, we're proposing that they get a tax break on their ability to repatriate their overseas earnings. We've all talked about the, the issue we have with our tax code and how it's created a situation where U.S. corporations are accumulating significant amounts of cash overseas. Under the American Infrastructure Fund, they have a way of bringing back up to 10% of that capital in a way that we know will create American jobs by investing in our infrastructure. So we put forth the American Infrastructure Fund as a solution to the problems that my uh, colleague from California is discussing as an innovative financing solution to deal with the infrastructure problems that this country has and to do it in a way that's additive to the existing programs that exist and it can be done in a way that is fiscally responsible in light of the, the uh, fiscal pressures that the country has. So this is some of the work that we've been doing in our office to advance this important work that uh, my friend in uh, California uh, is talking about this evening. Uh, Mr. Delaney, that is a, a fascinating way of bringing capital to this pr uh, program. California has numerous high technology companies, Apple and many, many others. All of them come to us, representatives from California, and they complain about the repatriation. They'd like to bring those earnings from overseas back to the United States. They've got, I don't know, maybe a trillion dollars sitting out there, if I recall the number. Uh, maybe that's about, I don't know, whatever the number is, a lot of dollars. They want to bring it back, but they don't want to face the 35 percent corporate tax. So you're suggesting that they could bring that back in a way that they wouldn't face that tax, but the money that came back would be, at least a portion of it, would be used to finance this infrastructure bank. Have I got That's this right. pretty much correct here? That's right. And, and the estimates are up to almost $2 trillion of, of cash. I overseas. understated it. $2 trillion $2 sitting trillion offshore. Dollars. And that reflects a significant problem with our tax code, which we'll reserve for another session another day. for discussion. That's but this thing called taxes number exactly. two up here. Exactly, which is a long discussion. But w under the Partnership to Build America Act, the American Infrastructure Fund is capitalized by selling $50 billion of bonds. And we sell them to corporations. And they're not guaranteed by the federal government, so there's no taxpayer risk. For every dollar of those bonds the company buys, they can bring back a certain amount of their overseas earnings. We estimate that to be four to one, but it's actually determined by an auction that will be done by the fund. So if $50 billion of bonds are subscribed to, by some of the companies in your uh, state, some of the countries in my state, Maryland, because the district I represent, uh, part of the district I represent, Montgomery County, Maryland, has a 270 transportation corridor that is filled with uh, information technology companies and biotechnology companies, very similar to the kind of companies that are in your district. <coughs> so some of them may be from Maryland as well. But if they bring back, if they buy $50 billion of bonds, then they can bring back $200 billion from overseas tax free. The bonds, again, are non guaranteed by the government, 50-year, 1% interest. So they're not an attractive investment. But the ability to bring back that money tax-free is the incentive for them to do it. They get to bring back money and invest it in our economy. We get $50 billion to capitalize a fund that could provide $2 trillion, provide the capital base to provide $2 trillion of financing over 50 years without any cost to the taxpayer. So I think you summarized it, uh, su summarized it perfectly. I think you did. Um, I was trying to grasp the, the totality of it. It's a process in which now this is a piece of legislation. It's here in the House. Uh, I would hope that our colleagues on the Republican side that control the passage of legislation, mm -hmm. even the taking up of legislation in committee, would, would look at this and go, oh, you mean we can actually build $200 million of, or $2 trillion of infrastructure over a 50-year period without any appropriation, with no taxpayer dollars uh, other than some amount that's foregone yes. in, the, in the repatriation? 
Very interesting. Very, very exciting proposal, yes. and I would hope we take it up. I'm sure that there will be questions about who gets the money, who decides which projects are going to be selected. Right. And under our legislation, the states make a determination. The uh, American Infrastructure Fund has to develop an allocation process so that every state has an allocation based on their economic size. So California being the most popular state you would, would have, have the largest allocation. Oh, I like that already. Yes, I knew you would. I knew you would uh, uh, enjoy that feature of the legislation. But uh, in all seriousness, we, we have had good bipartisan support. I have 20 of my Republican colleagues on the bill with uh, 20 Democratic colleagues. 18 are on it officially right now. And we've received very constructive feedback from all of my colleagues. They've all worked to make the legislation better. Uh, and we're looking forward to continue to build good bipartisan support because I think we both know that um, when the private sector and government work well together on economic challenges, we get very good economic outcomes. So I want to thank you for, your, for giving me this time. This uh, Mr. Delaney, thank you very, very much. Uh, obviously, Maryland is very, very, very well represented with some innovative thinking from their representatives. Uh, the infrastructure bank's not new. This is a new way of financing it and a very exciting one. Thank you so very much for joining us this ideas. evening. We'll continue to work on this and we'll talk about it again in the future. Um, now, California's the most populous state. I didn't say popular, although I would certainly uh, say that. Uh, Texas being the second biggest in geography, we now have uh, our new representative from Texas. Uh, joining us, Mr. Castro. Thank you so very, very much. And Texas likes to talk about uh, all the good things they're doing. One good thing they did was to send you here. Yeah, well, so, Mr. Thank Castro, you please join us and uh, talk to us about Texas and infrastructure. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, Congressman, for your leadership on this issue and on this legislation, Make It in America. Uh, thank you to Congressman Delaney for all of the work that he's doing on infrastructure. You know, in Texas, infrastructure obviously is very important to us. Uh, we have a state that obviously is incredibly large in land mass, second only to Alaska. We have, for example, the most number of bridges of any state in the nation, uh, miles and miles of interstate highways and roads. Uh, and so I stand here tonight with you to reaffirm the point that we must never neglect our infrastructure of transportation, building out our roads, our highways, our waterways, our mass transit systems, making sure that Americans can get to where they want to go uh, by air, uh, by land, by sea. Uh, we make sure, we must make sure uh, that our infrastructure of transportation keeps up also and is competitive with that of other places in Europe and in Asia, uh, particularly for commercial purposes. But also, Congressman, I wanted to point out that just as there is an infrastructure of transportation, there is in America another kind of infrastructure, and that is an infrastructure of opportunity that allows each of us to pursue our American dreams. So, for example, just as there are streets and highways that help us get to where we want to go on the road, there is an infrastructure of opportunity in America that allows us to get to where we want to go in life. So, that infrastructure of opportunity would include, for example, uh, great public schools and universities, a strong health care system, and an economy that's built around well-paying jobs so that people can support themselves and their family members. In fact, when we ask the question here in Congress, what is it that distinguishes America from among the nations of the world, I would argue that it is the fact that over the generations, Americans have come together to build out that infrastructure of opportunity that allows each of us, no matter our race, our class, where we come from allows each of us to chase our American dream. Now, I think all of us understand, and I think you would agree with me, I've never met any American who has asked for a guarantee of success in our nation. Folks don't ask for a guarantee of success. What they ask for is the opportunity to pursue that success. So we must continue building not only the roads that we need and the highways, but also the great schools and universities, a strong health care system, and, as you mentioned, with the American Jobs Act, making sure that Americans can go to work and support themselves and their family. And I'll just wrap up with this, you know. Uh, there's been a lot of debate around here, and I know in the last hour there was, uh, about uh, immigration. And there's a big debate about how to handle our immigration issue. Uh, and that is a challenge and has been a challenge for this Congress. Uh, but if you put aside the debate over what to do with folks who are here, uh, whether it's visas or you know, permanent legal residency, whatever it is, and we just ask ourselves, why is it for a few hundred years now that America has been the destination nation 
for people from literally every corner of the earth. Why is that? I would argue it's because we have built up a place, a society of opportunity, where people can pursue their dreams. Now, Congressman, I think uh, you would agree with me, in all of the immigrants I've met, whether they came from Europe or Asia uh, or Mexico or somewhere else, I've never heard anybody tell me that the reason they came to our country was because they were looking for the lowest corporate tax rate. People, in fact, come here because they're looking to be part of a system of opportunity that, as Americans, we have built up together. And we must make sure, all of us in Congress, working as Republicans and Democrats, united for our country, make sure that when somebody asks 50 years from now or 100 years from now, where is it on earth that people want to be, that the answer is still the United States of America. We must build out the infrastructure of transportation and the infrastructure of opportunity to achieve that answer. Mr. Castro, thank you so very, very much. Often, in fact, this is what I've often talked about, infrastructure in a physical way. Right. That is the physical features of roads and water systems. Uh, but your discussion of infrastructure being the infrastructure of opportunity, which does include those things. Oh, absolutely. It also includes this one, which is education. A critical element uh, in the uh, in the process of education. If we're going to build infrastructure of opportunity, this is where opportunity starts for, for virtually everybody in this country. They the opportunity to get a good education, and part of that is the physical building itself. Obviously, it's the teachers, the way in which the uh, subjects are taught, uh, and access access to not only K through 12 but also higher education. Uh, this is one of the things that when we talk about physical infrastructure, we need to talk about the classroom itself, uh, about the facility, air conditioning, as well as the uh, communication systems, computers, and other kinds of uh, communication systems. Absolutely. So the infrastructure of opportunity. Uh, what a wonderful theme. What a wonderful way of describing America and this discussion we heard before we came on the floor about immigration. You could not be more correct. Thank you, Congressman. And I would point out, um, for example, in Texas, we have our challenges. In California, for example, you've got nine research universities, which are the top-tier universities. And in New York, they've got about seven. Uh, in Texas, we only have three right now. Uh, and so we've got a long way to go to catch up. So we are trying to catch up. In fact, there was a, good, a, a bit of good news. Uh, Governor Perry today uh, signed a bill that would create a uh, merge two schools, two colleges, two universities in what is known as the Texas Valley in South Texas and ultimately will create a medical school. And that's very important for a few reasons. And I want to use uh, real quick this example in the Texas Valley in South Texas uh, along the Texas-Mexico border which is often in conversation here in Congress. Uh, it's a place of about between a, a million and a million and a half folks. Uh, very hard-working people uh, wake up early in the morning, go to work, uh, put in a hard day's work without complaint, and then go home to their families, often go home and say prayers of thanks to God for what he's given them. Well, in that area known as the Texas Valley, cities like Edinburgh and McAllen and Westlaco and Brownsville, did you know that you still can't get a medical degree anywhere in that area? Anywhere south of San Antonio, my hometown, you can drive the four hours to the, to the between San Antonio and the Texas-Mexico border and not be able to get a medical degree. Uh, you can't get a law degree anywhere between San Antonio and the Texas-Mexico border. Uh, and there are only a handful of PhD programs. So when I speak of the missing pieces, literally, of the infrastructure of opportunity, to me, the Texas Valley is one example of that. And I know many folks like uh, Congressman Hinojosa, uh, Congressman Cuellad, Congressman Vela, uh, they're working very hard to change those things, uh, but they've been, those changes have been slow in coming. But I will also point out, uh, with regard to the infrastructure of transportation, which is part of the infrastructure of opportunity, that is also missing. So for example, when you try to drive, uh, my fiance is from a small town called Alton, Texas, right near Mission, a few miles from the Texas-Mexico border. When you drive from San Antonio down to the valley, uh, you drive those four hours or so, and there's no continuous interstate highway that you can take uh, without stopping in town after town. So you can imagine you know, what that means to a traveler, but even more so, 
what it means for commercial enterprises, for our businesses who are trying to get their goods, uh, tr trying to do trade, trying to get their goods to Mexico, or trying to get their goods, importing their goods from Mexico. Those things are very, very important, and we've got to continue to do this great work that you've been a leader on. I thought for a moment you were going to go into more detail about your own personal emotions as you <laughs> stop in every one of these towns on your way to see your fiancé. But we'll let that go for another time. <laughs> well, I've got a story tomorrow. I think I'm going to join the folks about immigration uh, on the immigration issue and what I've learned visiting those places. Well, there's much to learn about that. But again, if you go back to our Making in America agenda, these issues, the labor market and education, fit into that infrastructure of opportunity. I've always said that if you're going to build an economy and have social justice, there are four things you must always do, five things you must always do. First, you must have the best education system in the world that's available to everybody so that they can climb that ladder, as you were saying earlier, that they have that opportunity. Secondly, that you have a great research system, and we do. Actually, we have 10 campuses of the University well, of California. And some of the state universities are now picking up some of the research agenda also. But anyway, the research, and then you need to make things coming out of that. That's the manufacturing. That may be a, a computer uh, program, or it could be an automobile. But you need to be making things, adding, creating value. The infrastructure being uh, the fourth, and the fifth being you've got to be willing to change. You can't do what you did yesterday. You need to deal with things of tomorrow. Uh, there are many other pieces to this. Uh, we talked a little bit about education here and the way it works. Uh, this was a statistic that was given earlier. John, uh, Mr. Delaney went through this very quickly. But for every dollar you invest in the physical infrastructure, you're going to get back immediately about $1.57 as that money churns through the economy as the uh, concrete is purchased as it's, as it's put in place. Men are, and women are doing that work, and then that churns back through the economy, actually giving great stimulation to the economy. Not our words. These are Mark Zandi's words, the chief economist of Moody's Analytics. So this is a very, very well-known thing. So if we want to really move the economy, we can take Mr. Delaney's idea about infrastructure bank, not an appropriation, invest and put people to work and give a boost to the economy. And in doing so, you also create better tax flow into the government. Um, the other thing, and, and this is something that I know Texas is uh, working on, as is California, and that's rail transportation. Absolutely. If I recall correctly, Fort Worth is the headquarters of BNSF Railway. And uh, this is just a picture of a, of a new uh, Amtrak train that was manufactured in Sacramento. Uh, part of the infrastructure investment that is now being made here in the Northeast Corridor between Washington and Boston, uh, this new train is 100 percent American made. Because back in the stimulus bill, about 80-some uh, trains were uh, proposed to be purchased, about a half a billion dollars, and they wrote into it, must be American-made. And so Siemens, a German company, mm -hmm. came to Sacramento where they had a uh, light rail shop, decided they could build a heavy-duty locomotive and make it 100% American-made. So this one is now being tested, the uh, first model out, and there'll be some uh, 80 of these on the Northeast Corridor, increasing the speed, the movement, the transportation system. And for all of America, rail transportation, light rail and heavy rail, and even high-speed rail, are ways in which we move our physical transportation. And if we cause those products to be made in America, we also increase our manufacturing base. Again, part of the American uh, program of making it in America using infrastructure. Well, and I think, um, I think you're absolutely right on that. Uh, for example, uh, Congressman Germendi, last week San Antonio received word that our exports went up in a year 33%. 33% increase in exports. From the city and the region of San Antonio. In San Antonio, coming from San Antonio. Uh, and so these channels for getting our products to different markets are absolutely vital to continuing that success. Well, there's so many different things that we, uh, we could talk about in, uh, in this process. And, and this is a piece of legislation that uh, actually I've introduced for the last couple of years. Uh, this particular piece of legislation 
uh, 1524 says that if it's your tax money, the American taxpayer's money, then it ought to be used to purchase American-made equipment. And that's exactly what happened with the earlier stimulus bill and the manufacturing of these uh, uh, locomotives in California. But there's some 200 different suppliers all around the nation that are supplying that. So we can really boost the economy in the transportation system, but also in the energy system. Solar, wind, all of those are subsidized, as is oil and coal. They're subsidized with American taxpayer money, either with a tax credit or a subsidy or a direct payment. And if we said, OK, but you must produce that product in America. So the wind turbines make them in America, uh, similarly with solar panels and other kinds of equipment. So these are all things that, that fit into this. But the theme that you hit on early on, I think, is so very, very important, and that is the infrastructure of opportunity. I really like that, and I think that as we go about our business here of passing laws or not, we ought to keep in mind that our task is to create that opportunity. Well, and I think, Congressman, uh, uh, when we think about issues that come up here, uh, issues that sometimes succumb to the gridlock that is Congress these days, for example, on the student loan issue, that's why it's so important that we make sure that we do right by students and not allow that student loan interest rate to double. Because in these tough economic times, it's hard enough for families to scrounge up the money to help send their kids to college and for the kids to you know, work a job or two and go to class. Uh, they're often in this work school tug of war where they're trying to, many of them work part time or full time and at the same time take their 15 hours or 12 hours uh, to graduate in a decent number of years. Uh, the least that Congress can do is make sure that we set a student loan rate uh, that is affordable and reasonable uh, for the economic times that we live in. Uh, and those things are not handouts. That is, those are investments to make sure that you've got a well-educated population. Uh, these are loans, after all. Uh, they're paying these back. Uh, but it's also, I think, their government saying, look, we're going to lend you this money at a decent rate. Uh, we're going to make sure it comes at a reasonable rate. Uh, and you're going to pay it back to us. But from that, we're going to get folks who are engineers, who are police officers and firefighters and doctors, and all of the things that keep our society moving and keep this country the greatest nation on earth. Mr. Castro, you put that out so very well. It's a critical investment that the American public makes in the next generation so that this economy can move forward. There's also, we've been debating this on the floor, a bill passed out of here that would set the student loan interest rate as a variable rate, much like a home mortgage variable rate. Watch out. We know what happened with the variable rates that went on. And it was interesting that that particular bill actually would create income, a large amount of income, if I remember the numbers, some $30 billion over the next 10 years of income. And so it was like, wait, wait a minute, are we really just doing this to get, our, get the money back? Or are we looking at this as a profit center? I think it was a serious mistake first to do variable interest so that would move up quite possibly to more than what the doubling of the 3.4 percent would be to maybe 8, 9 percent, 10 percent. Bad idea. And looking at the problem incorrectly. The way to look at it is just as you said, this is a way for the American public to make an investment in a student at a low interest cost to the student, right. but sufficient to repay the federal government. Not as a profit center, but as a repayment. There's some administrative cost to be sure. That's how we ought to look at this, because it is a crucial investment, the most important investment of all that educational investment. Uh, and I couldn't agree more. You know, just personally, uh, I started school, started college in the fall of 1992, uh, 21 years ago now. Um, and in 1991 or 1992, my mom made less than $20,000, uh, and she was getting ready to send two sons, twin sons, of course, I have my brother, um, off to Stanford University in Northern California. And you can imagine how daunting that was. But there is no way that my brother and I could have gone 
to college and graduated uh, without student loans, uh, without uh, Perkins loans, without Stafford loans. Uh, same thing for law school. Um, and so these are vital. I mean, that's just my own story. There are literally millions of stories like that across the country. And a very sound investment was made in you and your brother, who I believe is the mayor of San Antonio. That's right. Indeed. Um, much to be said. I'm just going to share with you, and perhaps you have a similar situation uh, from your own experience. This weekend, I was back in my district in Northern California uh, in uh, Yuba City in Marysville. Now, the Feather River, which is one of the major rivers, tributaries of the Sacramento River, um, goes right through these between these two towns, Marysville on the east side and Yuba City on the west side, uh, this is one of the most dangerous places in America. The Feather River and the Yuba River, which uh, come together at that place, have a long history of deadly floods. Mm. And what the citizens need there is the help of the federal government to complete the levee and enhance the levees around their communities. Uh, we had a major debate here on the floor last week with the uh, energy water bill in which the uh, Ryan budget, that is the Republican budget, was seen in its fullness for the first time. And what that budget called for was a diminution, in fact a very, very significant cut in the infrastructure investment for the Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps of Engineers builds the levees, the locks, and other major public works. Sequestration took $250 million of construction out of the Army Corps of Engineers, and right now construction projects that were scheduled are not taking place. In addition to that, the proposed budget and the actual appropriation bill even further reduced the money available to the Army Corps of Engineers to build the levees to protect communities all across the United States. At the very same time, money was shifted from the Corps of Engineers and the levees and the things that are necessary to protect American citizens and others who are here from devastating floods. Money was shifted to build more nuclear weapons. And you go, what in the world is that all about? We've got 5,500 nuclear weapons now. Uh, the money was shifted to rebuild to uh, make sure that they all worked, and there's no way we would ever use all of them or, unless you want to end life on the Earth. But yet that was a priority issue. Nuclear weapons versus levies to protect Americans. The wrong priority, but it is a fundamental example of the infrastructure needs and the wrong-headed priorities that sometimes find their way into legislation. Unfortunately, that bill passed. That is the statement of the House of Representatives. Now, every Democrat voted against it, but that did pass the House. That now will go over to the Senate, and the Senate, I am sure, will never set that priority the same as this. But in a conference committee, we're now looking at a tug of war between nuclear weapons and levies to protect Americans. Hopefully the levies will win. We'll see. That's one example. When I went home this weekend, people asked me, what was that all about? And I said, that was about bad priorities and an austerity budget working together. Well, and we know, of course, Congressman, that the sequester was uh, taking a meat cleaver uh, rather than uh, trying to do real cuts, real smart cuts. Um, and so uh, I agree with you on that. Uh, with respect to the work of the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, the work that, the important work that they do uh, is often felt in San Antonio and in Texas, of course, uh, during what, everything that happened with Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans uh, and all of the important work that they had done around that. Uh, and so you're right. I think that Americans expect uh, that they will be in homes that are not going to flood, uh, that there's going to be infrastructure in place to make sure that that water doesn't come up and run them out of their homes, uh, you know, ruin their homes and their property. But also, uh, without adequate levies, you clearly slow down economic development. Now, not every city has a, a flood problem, although certainly in the great Midwest, you see this in all of the cities along the Missouri uh, and the uh, Mississippi and Ohio rivers. So that entire huge basin, which is more than 
uh, 60 percent of the United States. There are serious flood issues uh, there. And so this extends to the, and certainly we see it on the East Coast with Superstorm Sandy, and you mentioned Katrina. So all across this nation, the issue of flood protection is critical. In my own uh, district, Sacramento, there's a portion of Sacramento that is rated, I think it's now rated as the most dangerous city in the United States, the Natomas area of Sacramento. With the rebuilding of the levees in uh, New Orleans, I think now Natomas, Sacramento is rated as the most dangerous. We're talking about a flood situation that could occur because the levees are substandard in which the river would break. We have floods in the winter, so the water temperatures in the 50, 45, 50 degree temperature, if that were to break, the inundation would be immediate and it would be 20 feet and the survival time is measured in minutes, not in hours. That water hits you, you are hypothermia and you're dead. So it's an extreme problem. We need to rebuild those levees. The community is taxing itself to a fairly well to do it, but the federal government is backing away from its previous commitment. The rest of the story is that the economic development potential in that community is stifled. It's not just housing, it's all kinds of economic development. The Sacramento International Airport is in that area. And so for the lack of money to build the levees, human life is at risk, several tens of thousands of people, and economic development. So these things come together, infrastructure being the foundation upon which the economy grows, and in some cases, certainly the case of levees, upon which people's lives depend. And you make an important point about neglect of that infrastructure, uh, not only with levees and with waterways, uh, but uh, you and I are both aware, as the country is, of the tragic examples over the last several years in Minnesota, for example, the bridge collapse, more recently in Washington, I believe, in that bridge collapse. Uh, those are lessons to this Congress that we cannot neglect our infrastructure, uh, that it, it is vital. You know, I mentioned Texas. We have about 1,300 bridges uh, that are, have been declared by that same report that uh, Congressman Delaney mentioned, declared functionally obsolete. Uh, 1,300 functionally obsolete bridges in Texas. That's one in six. Um, and so those are things that we've got to tend to here. Uh, but it also, it also you know, begs the point that whether it's building out the infrastructure of transportation or building out the infrastructure of opportunity, that that doesn't happen by itself, it doesn't happen by accident, it doesn't happen by luck, that the United States government and the Congress must make those smart investments. Uh, we must continue to make those investments if we are going to be the land of opportunity, not just five years from now or 20 years from now, but 50 and 100 years from now. I think it's about time for us to wrap up, but I want to, uh, I want to engage the public. I don't know how many people are watching C-SPAN this evening. Uh, I would like to think there are some 300 million, but I suspect that's overstating it away. Uh, but I would ask the public to comment to you and I about their infrastructure in their community. What do they need in their community? Uh, and what, uh, how they think it could be financed is Mr. Delaney's uh, proposal for an infrastructure bank uh, based upon the repatriation of foreign earnings. Uh, does that make sense? Does it make sense to uh, do what the president said, which is to appropriate $50 billion right now to build infrastructure? Many different alternatives, but I'd love to hear from the public, and here's how they could do it. I'm going to use yours down here, too. Absolutely. Stay in touch, stay informed, stay connected. Uh, Facebook, so you can go to Facebook, facebook.com slash rep, R-E-P, Garamendi, G-A-R-A-M-E-N-D-I, or rep Castro, C-A-S-T-R-O. Okay, either way, rep Garamendi, rep Castro. Twitter, twitter.com slash, again, rep Garamendi, or rep Castro, or... You can go to our website, www, in this case, garamendi.house.gov, or www.cast. Well, my Twitter, oh, the, the house one, that's right. Uh, it should be probably Jay Castro. Is it? It's 
J, J, J Castro, J I believe. Castro. I think yeah. there's more than one around, one, more than one Castro. So there's only one Garamendi yeah. around. But, so they probably be jcastro.house.gov. That's the website. And they can get in touch that way and keep informed. So I welcome people. Anybody out there watching this discussion about infrastructure, how it can be financed, why it's important, what it means for economic development, education, what it means for social justice and opportunity, and if you like the theme, the infrastructure of opportunity, uh, you can contact me and I'll pass it on to Mr. <laughs> Castro or you can go directly to jcastro at house.gov or uh, Facebook. Dot com, Rep. Garamendi, Rep. Castro. I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Castro and thank Mr. You. Delaney, for joining me this evening. Uh, next week, we'll take up one of the other issues that we have. Um, we'll probably talk next week about energy and how we can improve the energy situation uh, to meet the uh, climate change. I do have one more thing that I really must do before I close down, and that is talk about uh, geothermal energy and one of the communities I represent, Lake County. Uh, we have a critical natural resource uh, opportunity in this nation, and it's beneath the soil, beneath the ground, and it happens to be the heat of the earth. It finds its way to the surface in many places around the world, and it certainly does in my district, Lake County. That uh, heat comes from the geothermal, and it is an extraordinary natural resource, and it is clean energy. One of those, it's one of the most abundant natural resources that can be found anywhere, and it's often overlooked. It has the ability to become one of the key future sources of energy. We'll talk about it much more next week, but I do want to talk about its use here in the United States. It is environmentally friendly. Dry steam and flash geothermal plants emit just 5% of the carbon dioxide and less than 1% of the nitrous oxygen oxide of traditional fossil fuel coal power plants. The binary geothermal installation emissions are near zero. More importantly, geothermal energy is cost effective. Over the last two decades, the cost of generating geothermal power has decreased by 25%. Additionally, geothermal can be produced domestically in California, the Imperial Valley, uh, the Lake County area are two of the most uh, used geothermal resources. Nevada has enormous resources, and there are many other places within the United States. And it can be sent, the same resources available in many, many parts of the world. So we as a world, and certainly as a state and nation, ought to be moving more aggressively to harness our geothermal resources. It's also a good jobs place. Uh, creating more than 1.717 million dollar annual uh, wealth in the geothermal region of uh, Sonoma, Mendocino, and Lake Counties. Uh, it's also a tax source. Lake County and Sonoma counties receive over 11 million dollars in annual tax revenues directly from the Geysers geothermal field. And Lake County has saved millions of dollars in the disposal cost by funneling 8 million gallons of wastewater back into the ground for the harnessing of geothermal resources. So I draw the attention tonight uh, to the uh, nation, to the potential of geothermal and the success that it's had in my uh, district in Lake County and in my neighboring county of Sonoma. So thank you so very much, Mr. Uh, Speaker. We thank you and we yield back. The gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3rd, 2013, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Duffy, for 30 minutes. I appreciate the Speaker for yielding. Uh, tonight, uh, we want to have a conversation about immigration and immigration reform, uh, because we recognize that in 1986, when Congress and the President came together for immigration reform, it didn't work. It didn't work for immigrants, it didn't work for our border, and it didn't work for America. Just recently, we've seen that our Senate has come forward with proposed legislation, uh, and that too doesn't work. It's a proposal that doesn't secure our border. Uh, it's a proposal that won't work long term uh, for America. Uh, we're here uh, to address the problems that we face in this country with real solutions that work for people and work for our country. We're here to say, that we're with you, that if you want to work hard and you want to contribute to our American economy, 
We're with you. If you want to obey our laws, and if you want uh, a shot at our free enterprise system, we're with you. If you uh, believe that America has a right to secure her borders, to know who's coming in and out of our country, we're with you. If you want to pay taxes and pledge allegiance to America, we're with you. And if you want your shot at the American dream, we're with you. We're a party that looks at the big problems in our country and we come out with big solutions to fix those problems. We're not a party of no, we are a party of solutions. And that's why I'm honored to be here tonight with uh, a few of my fellow colleagues to talk about the solutions in regard to immigration, solutions that are going to work. And that's why I'm honored right now uh, to yield to the gentleman from Illinois uh, for his thoughts on immigration. Well, thank you, and I, I, I thank the gentleman from Wisconsin for organizing the time and bringing us all together. This is an important discussion. Uh, you know, when I think back to the, uh, somebody who's a big hero of mine, Ronald Reagan, I think back to the 80s, of course, and I think of what Ronald Reagan talked about, and he discussed America as a shining city on a hill, a city that everybody around the globe looks at and says, I want to live there. Or they look at that, the United States, and say, that is a country that I, wanna, I want my country to look like. That's the party, that's frankly the Republican Party. And I understand that, you know what, over the last few years, the Republican Party hasn't necessarily done a great job of messaging that. That's our fault. But I look at somebody like Ronald Reagan, and I look at the vision he's put out for America, and I say, you know what, that is the Republican Party that I join. That's the Republican Party that I believe in. The party that believes that a kid in inner city Chicago should have the same opportunity as a kid raised in the best suburbs of Chicago. That's what we believe. So when we talk about this, uh, this really, I guess, controversial issue of immigration, I've just picked, you know, you have Americans on both sides of the issue and Americans that have gotten ginned up on either side of this issue that are speaking to this with anger. I think something we have to do as a nation and something that I think we need to do here right now is to say, let's have this conversation about immigration, but let's do it in a way that, where we can discuss what America wants to be and what America's about and how to give most people around the world the opportunity to be in America. You know, I think most Americans would agree that the first thing we have to do is ensure that we have a safe border, uh, not only just because of the idea of immigration and ensuring that we have a system that works for everybody, but because, look, on a porous border, you have an opportunity for terrorists to come through with weapons that we don't want in the United States of America. We've seen in our schools, I visited uh, a place called Rosecrans the other day in Rockford, Illinois, uh, that has teenagers that are suffering from drug addiction. You know what the cheapest drug that they can get a hold of is now? You'd think maybe marijuana, right? It's actually heroin. You know where most of the heroin's coming through? It's coming through the border of Mexico. So I think when we talk about border security, we're not talking about it in an angry way. We're just saying as a sovereign nation, we have a right to determine our immigration policy and you can't determine an immigration policy with a porous border. And once we do that, once we have honest border security and we're honest with the American people, then we have to have this discussion about how do we passionately and compassionately deal with folks that want the American way as well, too. That's a conversation I'm looking forward to having tonight over the next few minutes. And uh, as we move on, I'd like to yield to the uh, gentleman from California, a great member of Congress, Mr. Cory Gardner. Well, well thank, I thank the gentleman from Illinois, although uh, there's many people in Colorado from California. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we, we, we maybe... Oh, I said California. That's, that's quite Colorado. all right. Colorado, sorry. <laughs> but we're all, we're all together on the same issue uh, tonight on the House floor uh, as we discuss the important issue of immigration reform. And many of us elected in 2010, elected in 2012. We, we came to Congress because we wanted to find ways to make America work, uh, to get this country working again, to find uh, ways to get government out of the way and create an economy that's strong and growing so people could find the jobs that they want to help feed their families, to send their kids to school without putting themselves into bankruptcy and to make sure that we do indeed have a better tomorrow than we do today. And so it is starting with those fundamental beliefs that we all came here to achieve, build a stronger country, to make life work for the American families that we recognize, a, a nation of immigrants, a nation that uh, provides an opportunity for people around the world, that beacon of hope, uh, to be a place for families to succeed to achieve their dreams about the American dream and indeed the American spirit. And so it is through that, those very values of, of compassion, 
uh, for the poor, compassion for people who want to build a stronger nation here at home, and the fairness that we know we can do it with, to build a system of laws that will stand strong, not just for a year or 10 years or 20 years, but moving forward beyond that, a system of laws that we know will make sure that people who want to be a great part of a healthy American economy indeed have that very opportunity. And so tonight, as we kick off a discussion on immigration and we join people around the country who uh, have differing opinions, as the gentleman from Illinois recognized, differing opinions on what to do, how to do it, when to do it, recognizing, though, that indeed we must do something to address a system that is broken in a way that meets those objectives of American values, compassion, fairness, and maintaining the rule of law in this country. And so I look forward to our conversation tonight, and I look forward to solutions for the American people that we can all be proud of, and knowing that this is not going to be an easy task, but one that we will address with all due and necessary urgency. And I'm joined tonight with, by our colleague from uh, North Carolina, uh, Mr. Hudson. We'll yield to you. Well, I appreciate that. I thank my colleague. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's an honor to be here tonight. Uh, you know, I'm a new member of Congress. I was elected uh, just last year, and uh, you know, I ran for Congress, first time I'd ever run for any office, because I want to come up here and fight for people. Because there are folks back home that are frustrated, they feel like their government is not being responsive to their needs, and so I'm here to represent them and be a voice for those people. I think of the home builder in Monroe, North Carolina, uh, who's told me he's just struggling just to keep his head above water and that he'll take any kind of work uh, just to keep his crew intact so he can, he can, he can keep them together. Uh, he'll do remodeling work or anything, just not even worried about profit so much as just being able to keep float. Um, I think about the families uh, across the district in, of, of the 8th District of North Carolina who uh, are looking to us for solutions. And so that's why I'm here tonight to join this conversation to talk about immigration reform. And the key to immigration reform, as far as I'm concerned, is we've got to, to, to look at compassion and we've got to look at fairness. You know, when it comes to fairness, uh, we are a nation of immigrants, but we're also a nation of laws. And so we've got to make sure we are enforcing the law in this country and that we're respecting the rule of law uh, when we look at making changes to immigration policy. We also need to look with compassion to those who have come here to the United States seeking that American dream uh, when, we, when we try to determine what we're going to do going down the road. But, but I think the key to this is the approach we're taking here in the House of Representatives. The Senate has passed an immigration bill. Uh, it's a bill that was cobbled together behind closed doors. Uh, it, was a, it was a bill, in my opinion, that went too far too fast. We're taking a much more thoughtful approach here in the House. We're going to go through the committee process. We're going to bring legislation to the floor so that we can debate these key issues affecting immigration as single issues and let the American people take part in this conversation and tell us what they think about issues like border security. Now, the key to immigration reform, in my opinion, is we've got to secure the borders first. And any legislation that, that we pass out of this chamber, uh, any agreement we make with the Senate on immigration, we've got to have a trigger uh, so that no other... Uh, uh, pieces of this immigration puzzle fall into place until we've got that border secure. And so we're going to work hard to make sure that's part of our solution. And uh, there's actually five pieces of legislation that have already passed out of Judiciary and Homeland Security Committees. I serve on the Homeland Security Committee. We passed the Border Security Results Act of 2013. And what this does is it requires the Secretary of Homeland Security to develop a comprehensive strategy to secure the border. What a radical concept. Let's actually have a plan. And so what we're saying in the House is give us a plan. We want the Department of Homeland Security to work with the border sheriffs to come up with a plan to secure that border and come back to Congress and say, here's what we need. Here's the sections where we need fences. Here's, here's the other types of technology, whether it be drones or, or other type of electronic monitoring. Th these are the pieces of the puzzle we need to secure this border. And then we also, a key to this is we've got to have a metrics so that we can measure whether the border is secure or not. Currently, we know the numerator, but we don't know the denominator. We know how many folks we're stopping coming across the border, but out of how many that are actually getting by that we aren't uh, rounding up. And if you look at, if you talk to any of the border sheriffs, you'll, you'll know that we're not anywhere close to being secure. And so that's a key component to this legislation. And, and I look forward to talking more about some of the legislation that came out of the Judiciary Committee, uh, some of the pieces of this 
uh, immigration reform puzzle that we need to, to discuss. But. Well, I, I, I just want to say quickly, and I, I thank the gentleman for your statements, everybody here for your statements. Yeah, I'm a member of the Air National Guard. Uh, just two and a half months ago, I actually did missions on the border of Mexico and Texas. And the, the purpose of that mission was to uh, we, I fly a reconnaissance airplane. And uh, the goal was to look for folks that had crossed illegally. And uh, in most cases, we were actually looking 60 miles into Texas. And uh, we were finding dozens of people, you know, basically each time we'd almost look somewhere, catch 60, 100 a night. And I think of that to say, you know, I, I, felt compa I felt bad for the folks that were hunkered down in Mott's, uh, that had crossed the border, that were told by some coyote that they paid their entire life savings to, told by some coyote that ushered them over that once you step foot in America, you're going to be just fine. And then they realize that the journey actually begins. And what you'd see is in many cases the Border Patrol, who do very hard, tough work, would apprehend most of these folks, and in some cases a couple of them would scatter, and they'd be left alone, 15 miles from the nearest town with no water, no food, and no idea where to go. I think of that, and I think of, uh, frankly, the administration saying that the border is already secure. And I think what that leads to, and I'll yield to the gentleman from Wisconsin in a second to say, I think what that leads to is there's an epic lack of trust of Washington right now. That's why, I can't, that's why actually the four of us here came to Washington is because we recognize there's a huge lack of trust in D.C. And so this idea that we're going to say, you know, from on high in Washington, we're going to just deem the border secure at some point when the administration has already deemed it secure is I think where the lack of trust is and why there's so much emotion tied into this. And I think this is a beginning step in having a great discussion about how to actually tackle this problem in a way that both sides can agree with and, and that's fair to the American people and, and to folks that want to live the American life. Yield to the gentleman of Wisconsin. And I appreciate the gentleman from Illinois yielding. And it is that very point. There's a lack of trust uh, with uh, the American people in Washington, D.C. And that's why we want to go through a step-by-step -step approach analyzing immigration and immigration reform. And as the gentleman from North Carolina said, we're here to fight for people. We're here to fix a broken system, and we're here to make it work. And we want to have a reform bill that's going to actually be fair. Be fair to those who have come to participate in our economy, but be fair to people who are Americans that say we are a country of laws, and we also are a country of immigrants. Um, and uh, I think the key, the key uh, first step is border security, as we've been talking about tonight, border security. And we have to uh, debate, uh, negotiate, discuss what does border security mean? And once we agree on what border security is, uh, and once we secure the border, we can go to the next phase, which is to say we have millions of people who've come into our economy, into our country. What's the fair way to treat them? In my opinion, and I'm, I'm telling you my opinion, and I'm open to hear feedback from all kinds of people as we have this conversation and debate. I haven't dug my heels in. But number one, uh, we have to say, do you get to go to the head of the line and become a U.S. citizen? Um, when you come here without documentation, I don't know that that's the first step after border security. But what I do think we have to do is say, if you've come here and you've participated in our economy, uh, we can offer some kind of legal status, a legal status that isn't citizenship, but it's a legal status that says, we're not going to arrest you in the middle of the night. We're not going to separate you from your grandparents or your kids. You can stay in our country because the border is secure. We're not going to have to address this problem 10 years from now or 20 years from now or 20, 25 years from now. We've addressed the border, which means we've addressed the inflow of people coming to our country illegally. And when that happens, we can offer those without documentation a status that says you can stay here and you can work. But if you want to become a citizen, you're going to have to get to the back of the line. You don't get a special pass, pathway into the front of the line. You, get, you can get in the back and you can become a citizen but you can stay here legally, and by staying here legally, you can pay your taxes, but that doesn't mean you can vote. And that also doesn't mean that you, uh, that you can collect off the entitlement system that we have here in America. And I think if, as we have this conversation with those who are here without documentation and those who care about the laws in America, we can have a conversation that actually works for everybody, that everyone can agree to. And I look forward to that conversation on finding a pathway and a consensus forward that works uh, for everybody. And uh, with that, I yield to the gentleman from Colorado. Well, the gentleman from Wisconsin brought up a great point, and that is the issue of a step-by-step -step process. And that's exactly 
what the House is undertaking. There are at least uh, four bills right now that are working their way through uh, the Judiciary Committee, uh, dealing with everything from an E-Verify system that can actually work and be used by uh, employers around this country to know that they are hiring somebody who is eligible, legally eligible for employment in this country. Uh, but we also have the opportunity to address uh, one of the other concerns that I hear at town meetings and uh, in private conversations at grocery stores across my district. And that's so many people who say, you know what, do we really need to do anything other than just enforce existing laws? Do we really need new laws? Do we need anything? And, and, and you know, the question that we have to, we have to give serious consideration to that question because the answer is, is yes, we do need immigration reform. Because of the 11 million people in this country that we believe are undocumented today, 42 percent of them are here who came legally, but entered into the country legally, but overstayed their visas. So how do we reform the visa system to actually make it work so that we, we know the process, the integrity of the process is what it needs to be? How do we create a system for those in agriculture to know that they have a workforce that is going to be readily able to and available uh, to harvest that fall's crops? Or if you're a dairy farmer, there's no one season for, for a dairy, but it's year-round. And so the availability of a workforce with the skills that they need, uh, but the certainty that they need. And it's those laws that we have to reform uh, to, to enforce and rebuild the trust of the American people in a step-by-step -step process. Because if we do this, we can actually create a system of laws that avoids the mistakes of the 1986 law through enforcement first, border security first, and making sure then that we deal with the, the situation at hand of the people uh, who do want to be a part of a healthy American economy. Well, I, I appreciate the my colleague point out some of the legislation that the Judiciary Committee has already passed uh, because I think it's important to understand that the House of Representatives is taking a different approach when it comes to immigration reform. And so we've passed the Border Security Results Act out of Homeland Security that I mentioned earlier. We have also passed the Legal Workforce Act, which is the bill that reforms the E-Verify system. It gives us a much more workable E-Verify program that gives our employers the certainty and the assurance that, that they can verify the citizenship of potential employees. Uh, the second piece of legislation that came out of the Judiciary Committee already is the Skills Visa Act. This has to do with what's called H-1B visas. These are for your high-skilled workers. These are for folks in science and math and technology who may come to the United States to go to university and learn these skills and, and learn uh, and, and, and get on this career path, but then they don't have a visa to stay here. You know, most industrialized nations in the world, 80 percent of the visas they give out are based on work skills and needs of the workforce. Here in the United States, it's about 12 percent of the visas we give out. We have a lottery to give out visas, and to me that is ridiculous. We have to reform this system so that we're giving out visas to the type of people we want to attract to this country. And so the Skills Visa Act is a piece of legislation that we're considering here in the House uh, that will do that. The, the third piece of legislation is called the SAFE Act. You know, one of the issues we talked about is we've got to enforce the rule of law. And frankly, uh, we don't have enough federal agents enforcing the law. And so what we need to do is empower states and municipalities, local governments that want to enforce the immigration law uh, to be able to do that. And so that's what the SAFE Act does. And then the fourth piece is the Agriculture Guest Worker Ag Act. And as my colleague mentioned, that is a critical piece for our economy. You know, there, there, there are at least 11 million uh, undocumented workers here in this country uh, that we know of. Many of those folks don't want citizenship. What they want is the ability to work here legally. And if we have an ag worker program that actually works, this is the H-2A program. And, and frankly, when I'm home, I go home every weekend and meet with our local folks, and I see farmers across my district. I ask them, how many of you are using the H-2A program? And you'd be amazed at how few people actually use the program because it's not workable. And so, as my colleague from Colorado asked the question that he hears in town hall meetings, do we really need to do any reformed immigration. Yes, we do, because we can't just secure the border with a fence and with technology if we still have that attraction, that need for illegal workers to fill jobs in this country. We've got to have a pathway to bring in legal workers, whether it's in agriculture or home building or some of the more high-skilled uh, types of jobs. We need a legal pathway to, to fill those positions. Otherwise, there's going to be this tug of illegals uh, that's going to continue to happen. And so we could build a 10-foot wall, uh, but someone's going to invent an 11-foot ladder. And so it's all got to be a comprehensive approach. That's why it's so important that we have that agriculture guest worker program as well. 
And so as you can see, uh, we in the house are looking at this step by step. We're looking at what are the actual problems so that we can address them in a very thoughtful way so that we aren't just rushing to get a big bill, as was once said by a former speaker of this house, let's pass this bill so we know what's in it. Well, we don't want to make that mistake again. We don't need a big, huge, comprehensive bill. We need to look at these issues in a very thoughtful, comprehensive way. And I'll yield back to one of my I, I appreciate the gentleman from North Carolina yielding. And uh, you look around at immigrants who come to America. Why do they come? They've come for the American dream. They've come for a, a better life for themselves. They've come for a better life for their children. They've come to the land of opportunity because they want that opportunity. They want to work hard. I'm from Wisconsin. Um, many people may not want to recognize this, but if you look at our dairy farms around Wisconsin, there's a lot of immigrants uh, who have come here without documentation that work on our farms. And it's hard, tough work, and they do it because they want an opportunity. And I know that uh, I travel around and I do a lot of town halls, and I know my colleagues do town halls uh, and, uh, and coffees. And I guess I would ask the gentleman from Colorado and Illinois uh, what you guys hear in your town halls of what people think about uh, uh, immigration, the problems and the solutions uh, that you face in your communities. Well, I think, gentlemen from Wisconsin, you know, it's the, the conversations I hear are, are from all, all angles, uh, whether it's somebody whose family uh, came here when they were very young, a uh, particular instance of, a, of a, a young woman who came into this country with her family when she was a baby. Uh, and she has gone to school in the same, the same class, same kids, same grade, same school system uh, for 12 years, eventually graduating as a senior number one in her class. Uh, and uh, she was brought here as, a, as a, a child. And when she asked me about what we were going to do, I said, your situation is an example of why we need immigration reform so that we can, we can actually have secure borders and that we can actually know the laws are being enforced and to avoid putting you in this situation. Uh, and years later, that conversation is repeating. We don't have the reform yet, and we're still looking for that reform. And how many years have to go by before we can actually say we have secured the border, we are enforcing the law, and we know that in 10, 20, 30 years, the visa program is solved, the E-Verify system is working, that uh, labor needs, whether it's housing, construction, agriculture, are being met in a system that actually encourages compliance with the law as part of a healthy American economy instead of uh, an underground or, or a way that does it in a, in a law-breaking fashion. And so uh, these are our opportunities to have, and I'll tell you one other story. There was a doctor in the eastern plains of Colorado who was here with, uh, with, his, with his, uh, all of his proper documentation. Unfortunately, his mother was ill and he needed to leave the country or was hoping to leave the country to say goodbye to her. But under our system of laws, if he left this nation, he couldn't come back. The only doctor in the county couldn't go away and say goodbye to his mom because he couldn't return. We need some common sense. That's a powerful story. And the gentleman from Illinois, well, your own story, I, you here at Town Hall. Yeah, that's a great, I mean, that, that's a great story. And I, you know, look, I just had a Town Hall meeting in Rockford, Illinois yesterday. And uh, you get folks from all ends of the political spectrum. That's the great thing about our democracy is we can have that respectful conversation. You have everything from folks that say, you know, hey, look, uh, you know, they, all you have to do is, as was mentioned, enforce existing laws, put more people on the border. And then you have a lot of people that, that say, hey, we need to just not have any more border enforcement and uh, just allow everybody here to become U.S. citizens. And I think, obviously, the answer is somewhere, frankly, in the middle of that. And when you talk to folks, and it doesn't matter if they're on the right or left or somewhere in between, everybody has a heart. You know, everybody cares about people. And when you talk about the fact that, as Mr. Gardner mentioned, you know, there are people here that are five years old by no fault of their own, sometimes 12 years old, or now they're getting ready to go to college and they realize that they're not here legally. This is something we ought to have a lot of compassion for and understand. And I think we've got to take some of the, the anger out of it on all sides of the aisle and just have a grown-up discussion and say, what do we have to do to fix the problem here? What do we have to do to fix the issue? Because frankly, I don't know how long I'll be in politics, but I don't ever want to have to address this again. And I think that's the thing, and that's what I hear at my town hall meetings is, you know, when you really get past kind of the initial arguments, folks say, we just really don't trust Washington, but unfortunately, you're the ones that have to solve this problem. And I hear similar things, and that's why people say, take it slow. Talk about it. Talk to us. Let's do what's right. Let's do what works for the, for the very people that you talked about. Some call them the dreamers, people who are here at 17 years old or 14 years old and know no other country. But they're here. They're, they're, they're part of... <laughs> our communities, our society, and our schools. 
Let's do what's right by them, but also let's do what's right uh, for our next generation by securing this border. I, w I want to talk about just one, one story. I, I have a good friend back in Ashland, Wisconsin. Um, he came here legally, but it goes to the work ethic of those who come for, for opportunity in the American dream, and uh, it's Bali. Uh, he owns a nail shop in Ashland, Wisconsin, and he was, uh, he was uh, raised in an orphanage in Vietnam. And the sister nuns, as he tells the story, uh, saved money in the orphanage and they sent him to America. And he couldn't speak the language. Uh, and I think he was in Texas where he got a job in a uh, fast food restaurant. And from fast food, uh, he got a job as a painter. And all the painters got mad at him because he was such a fast painter. And they're like, slow down, you're making us all look bad. He's like, no, I'm here to paint. In a very short order, he was the highest paid painter. Doesn't speak the language very well from Vietnam, but man, could he paint saved money, sent money back to the sister nuns in Vietnam to help the orphanage, but saved money himself, and he opened up a nail salon. And after that nail salon, another nail salon. And he sold them, and he, and, and, and he built them, and he sold them. Eventually, he said, I don't like the hot weather anymore. So he moved up to northern Wisconsin, where he bought a building on Main Street, Ashland. Right? And he opened up California Nails. And during the day, Lee does nails, and at night, the, this is an old 1900 building, uh, it, was, it was barren up there. He built five apartments by himself at night in the upstairs of his office building. And uh, uh, then in the downstairs, which was uh, not the nicest uh, location, he, he and smelled. He ripped it out and built new apartments downstairs. <coughs> but a guy that worked all day and worked all night for his shot at the American dream, helping his uh, people back at home, but helping our community, showing what immigrants do to make America better. And uh, it's that story, which is the American story, that I'm fighting for to have a system that actually works uh, for people who are here uh, legally and people who want a shot at what we have to offer. And uh, with that, I yield back to the gentleman from North Carolina for his comments on what he hears in his town halls on, on where we need to go with regard to immigration reform. Well, I appreciate that, and, and I think it's, it's many of the same things. You know, first of all, people don't trust Washington to actually address this problem. Uh, we've got a pretty bad track record here in the Congress. Uh, I think the other thing, though, I hear from my farmers, from the home builders, that they need labor, and we've got to have a legal pathway to get that done. And so we've just got to do it in a way that's fair uh, and, and respects the rule of law. Uh, would any of, any of you like to close? I believe we're getting near the end of our time. But. For, for a few more moments, I'm going to yield to the gentleman from, uh, from Illinois. Well, thank you. And, and as we do wrap up our time, I just want to say thank you to those uh, paying attention today and to, to my fellow members here. This is an important issue. This is the very beginning of a long discussion that we need to have because this is too important to get wrong. Uh, this is too important to, to rush because America is the greatest country in the world. And this is something we ought not ever forget. And in the process of doing that, we ought to remember that we're in America that many of us come from immigrants and an America that, frankly, is proud of where we've come from. So with that, I want to thank uh, the fellow members uh, of Congress here with me to talk about this. And this is the very beginning of, a, I'm sure, a long discussion about where we go from here. And with that, uh, I will... I will yield to the uh, gentleman from Wisconsin. And I know our time is short, and I appreciate the, the, the discussion. And I'm about to yield back uh, to the speaker. And we may have a few more minutes. We can actually uh, uh, continue this discussion tonight. Uh, but my time is done. And so with that, I'm going to yield back to uh, the speaker. The gentleman yields back. All right. Thank you. Under the speaker's announced policy of January 3rd, 2013, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Colorado Mr. Gardner, for 10 minutes. I, I thank the gentleman, uh, the speaker, for the additional time to continue this conversation. Thank you, Mr. Members, uh, for this opportunity to discuss what is truly one of the biggest issues this Congress, uh, this nation, faces. I, I recently was talking to a, a uh, reporter back home about the immigration debate taking place. They were asking about the Senate bill, asking about what the House was doing. And they said, well, aren't you acting with speed? Do you feel no urgency? And, and my response was, don't mistake the issue of speed with urgency. Because I think the House uh, feels every bit as urgent as uh, this issue truly is and truly deserves the attention of uh, how urgent the matter uh, is before all of us. But because of that, because of the urgency to do it right, it is going to take time, a deliberative process through this body, to make sure that we create that step-by-step -step opportunity for the people who are here legally, for people who want to come into this nation legally, to create the border security, the border enforcement, and then to have answers for every person in this nation. 
And so as we create this, this process, uh, this debate, as it moves forward, uh, every bit as urgent as any other American uh, before us, any other, uh, those, any other person who's desiring to be a part of this country. Uh, the urgency that we all feel to make sure that this happens. And so uh, to the gentleman from Illinois uh, or, or Wisconsin, North Carolina, thank you and would yield to anyone who wishes to uh, continue tonight. Well, I'm happy to jump in. Uh, I thank my colleague from Colorado for giving us this opportunity. Uh, you know, I, I think the problem is just the general distrust in the way Washington does things. And, and you only have to look at what the process we just went through uh, to understand why. Because any problem that we ever face as a nation Congress can solve it by very quickly passing a big piece of legislation with a great title and saying the problem is solved. Uh, unfortunately, in 1986, when we passed immigration reform, it didn't solve the problem. It gave amnesty now with a promise of border security later that we never saw. And I believe that's the same thing that happened with the Senate bill. We very quickly put out a bill uh, that has a great title, uh, thousands of pages that I doubt many folks have even read, uh, and, and saying the problem is now solved. And then you immediately hear the, the pundits and, and the folks uh, uh, who talk on TV about what happens in Washington saying, well, the House, since you aren't quickly moving a huge bill with a nice title, you don't care. But the truth is, we do care. But we're here to represent the people of the United States of America that sent us here. And we're going to do this in a very thoughtful way. And we're going to do immigration reform the right way so that we don't have to do it again in another 20 years. And with that, I'll yield to my colleague from Illinois. Well, I, thank you, Mr. Hudson. And, and uh, you know, look, the big picture of, of this is we're getting into a lot of the details we need to. Uh, but I want to just, as I give my last statement of the night, I, I just want to say this. <clears throat> you know, America is the land of opportunity. America is growing at less, frankly, organically, with folks just here, than we need to to continue to be a powerful economy in the world. So this is a discussion that we have to have. It's a discussion that we're required if we're going to be in 20, 30, 40, 50 years to be the most powerful country in the world. I sure hope, I don't have kids yet, but I sure hope when I do uh, that my grandkids can live in a world where America is unchecked, uh, the power in the world. They never have to worry about some of the problems that previous generations have had to worry about. But you know, this reminds me, and, and as, I, as I've heard folks on, frankly, the other side of the aisle that have said many times, you know, they, they use very emotional statements to talk about the, what the Republican Party believes. I've, I've heard us called the party of no. I've heard us called, you know, taking food from the mouths of children, not caring about anybody but the rich. I've heard it all. And look, I'll admit that in some cases, in many cases, the Republican Party has not done a good job of messaging. Uh, I remember seeing an ad on television where a pizza company talks about how they used to do it wrong and now they want to do it right. Well, here's what we need to do, and here's what my passion is. It's to let the American people know that, frankly, the Republican Party is the party of opportunity. We're the party that, as I mentioned earlier, believes that a kid born in the worst of circumstances should be able to pull himself out of those circumstances and be one of the most successful people in the world, including President of the United States, if he or she wants to be. That's what we believe. And that's when we go forward in this debate and any other debates, that's the message that I think is important to get out. Let's quit calling each other names. Let's quit trying to use cheap shots. Let's just have a grown-up discussion and say we both, all sides of the aisle, want a successful America. We just see how to get there differently. And let's have a discussion as adults, as members of Congress, and frankly, as Americans should have a discussion. With that, I'll turn to the gentleman from Wisconsin. And I think it's important for all of us to stand strong, stand tall, and lead, listen, communicate on this very important issue. And I know that's uh, what we want to do here tonight is throw out ideas but also prepare ourselves to listen to what uh, our constituents want, what America wants, and what's right for the country. I hear uh, some folks on my side of the aisle talk about, if you pass a border security bill, you're going to go to conference with the Senate, and you're going to adopt the Senate bill. We don't go to conference unless we agree to it. That's not going to happen. Let me be very clear. We're going to do a step-by-step -step approach and get a solution to immigration, and then we'll talk about going to conference if that's a pathway forward. But it's not one phase of the bill, then the conference. I got others that say, just enforce the current laws. And to those, I would ask, how is that working for us? It's not working. We have to engage in this conversation and do what's right. I got one more story for you. There's a family that uh, came from Mexico over to Arizona, and they had an opportunity to work in the, uh, in the mines in, uh, in Superior, Arizona. Hard work, tough work, 
where they were, they were Catholic, they raised a lot of kids on uh, not a lot of money. But one of their kids, as he grew up, he learned how to make piñatas and sell those piñatas. Um, he learned how to get fruit out of the desert, chop it up, slice it, dice it, and sell it as a delicacy within his community. A little entrepreneur. And uh, when he got older, he had a shot to go work in the mines like his brothers, but instead he said, you know what, I want to serve my country. And he went into the military. He had a chance to serve under Ronald Reagan. And he came from a, a, a party that's not mine. But he had a chance to serve under Ronald Reagan, and he had to see what uh, a party of opportunity had to offer him and his community and his family. He changed his vote. So he said, this is, this is who's looking out for me. This is who's looking out for my opportunity. And this is who's going to look out for my, 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 my children and my grandchildren. And he went on, got married uh, to a woman in, in, uh, in Spain who immigrated here legally, and uh, they had four kids. And I was uh, honored enough to meet their daughter and marry her and uh, move her to northern Wisconsin from warm Arizona, where we now have six children together. Um, that's my wife's immigrant story, whose father uh, came here as a first-generation American who worked his heart out and has his shot at the American dream. After the military, he became a school teacher, and then now he works uh, for a university. He's living the dream. His daughter is living the dream. All of us have those stories. My parents, um, my great-great-grandparents -great came from Ireland. We all have the story of an immigrant. And uh, I'm here to say, let's open our hearts, let's open our minds, let's have a real discussion that works. But let's also first say, secure the border so we don't deal with this again, and then do what's right by way of uh, folks who have come here um, and want their shot at the American dream. And with that, I would yield to the gentleman from Colorado. And that, Mr. Speaker, is the story of America. And I thank our colleagues for joining us tonight and look forward to this debate and look forward to hearing from you, uh, the people of this country, uh, as we enter this important conversation. And Mr. Speaker, uh, I yield back my time and I move that the House do now adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Accordingly, the House stands adjourned until 10 a.m. tomorrow morning for morning hour debate. The House returns tomorrow morning at 10 Eastern for general speeches, noon for legislative work. On the agenda, two Republican-led bills delaying provisions within the health care law. The first would postpone for one year the requirement that employers provide health insurance to all of its employees or face penalties. The House also plans to bring up a second bill that provides the same one-year delay to individuals and families. The Obama administration recently announced that it would delay enforcement of the health care mandate on businesses to make sure businesses have time to comply with the requirement. Republicans, however, say it's unfair to delay the requirement on businesses without providing the same to individuals. You can see live health coverage, as always, here on C-SPAN. In a few